You're listening to The New Paris. I'm your host, Lindsay Tremuda. I wasn't going to publish another episode this year, but here's what happened. The World Cup final happened, and President Macron went a bit cringe and inspired a whole new conversation I simply had to have before the new year. There's no better person to discuss Macron with than Rim Mamtaz, the former France correspondent for Politico who spent years reporting on the Macron administration and currently a consulting research fellow on European foreign policy and security with the double I double S. We dig into what happened, whether sports are necessarily political, and what challenges lay ahead for the French president in the coming year. Reem, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Lindsay. I've wanted to have you on this show for so long. Uh, and I mean, I've wanted to be on the show for so long. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, obviously, like you recently changed jobs, and I think it's maybe perhaps easier for you to comment on things now that you are no longer in a newsroom of sorts. But your experience uh, of the last, well, handful of years re- reporting specifically on France and Macron and the Macron administration give you a certain insight and expertise into the French president. And if we're talking today, it's because we just we just experienced the Coupe du Monde, the World Cup finale or final, as apparently we say in the U.S. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and there were some interesting things or, or moments that we discovered uh, watching that game on Sunday um, and, and certainly after the loss of the French team that that are very um, curious. And so I wanted to have you on as someone who maybe has a deeper insight into Emmanuel Macron to understand like what was going on. Why did he decide to swoop in and console awkwardly <laughs> an entire group of players who like clearly didn't want to have anything to do with him and also like is he is he like in love with them like what is happening what is going on (laughs) so okay here's the thing and I, i have to say in my four years of covering him and when i mean covering him emmanuel macron was the person i had to wake up thinking about and spend all day thinking about and listening to and trying to think of good questions to ask Uh, him and also obviously try to explain him to the world and then you know that was in all my days every day for for four years and in doing that what I did notice is that he is such a polarizing figure that whatever he does it elicits such huge very extreme reactions so people love him people hate him some people love to hate him and as always, as expected, um, his presence during both actually the semifinal and the final uh, games of the World Cup, obviously, in which the French national team was playing, um, really uh, led to a lot of, of reactions. Now, you were talking about, you know, what we saw, basically the images we saw at the end of the of the final, which France lost. So that's the first thing to keep in mind, right? France loses. Suddenly we see the French president on the actual pitch, um, (laughs) kneeling down. You rarely see a president kneeling down unless he's talking to a sick child or an elderly person who is in a wheelchair. Kneeling down, putting his arm around the shoulders of Kylian Mbappé. Kylian Mbappé being uh, the biggest rising star of French national football, but also of European and really world football. He is an extremely talented young man. He just turned 24. Uh, this was the second World Cup he he played in. He scored a record three goals in that final. I mean, he's, he's a phenomenon. And Macron and Mbappé have somewhat of a relationship. Uh, there's There's been a few skits that uh, the Macron Elysee has put out over the years of him calling Mbappé on his phone um, to play a joke or, uh, you know, it was part of his outreach to the youth, basically. And it seemed like Mbappé was happy to play along. But in this particular moment where Macron is kneeling down, Mbappé is on the pitch, sitting, uh, really just distraught beside himself that he he lost this final. And it just seemed like the last person he wanted to be touched by was Macron in that moment. 
And I have to say, I'm, I don't agree with like the majority of what people have been saying. Like in that moment, I really think it was very genuine. That first, that first attempt at consoling Mbappe. The problem then became that he attempted to do it about four additional times <laughs> in the span of the next half hour. <laughs> Oh, so awkward. I mean, there was someone put out an, uh, you know, like most internet memes, uh, you don't really know who's behind it, but someone put out like a, a triptyque with several, maybe it was even more than that, but of several images of, of Macron trying to console him. And the last one, you just see him like Mbappe's head into Macron's chest, but his his arms are just, you know, flailing you know he's not embracing macron back he's not touching him and it's just like a look of misery but also like imagine if you're a woman being sort of like forced into an embrace with a creepy man like that's that's what it looked okay. like and then there's and then there's the locker room speech which right. we're gonna get to that yeah okay All so right. but just one thing which is that um macron would never have done this with women ever that is one thing he is extremely aware of. He does not touch women the way some very creepy politicians do. Uh, so I just want to put that out there. He wouldn't have done it. I think he 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 allowed himself this because they were men, and it you know it wouldn't have been that controversial. But also, I I feel like I have to say and remind people, and people perhaps don't know this. Macron is like a diehard football fan. Like he loves to play football. He watches every single game. He's really into it. He screams at the screen and screams in the in the football stadium when he's there. And he, like he is all sorts of animated when he's watching football. Like this is really his thing, right? He loves it. Um, I was actually talking recently to one of the people who went to to college with him. Like this this sort of masters kind of degree that they do to, to all become sort of public uh, uh, officials in a, and he told me that even back then um, Macron used to play obviously in, in he used to play, play football with his friends and he was extremely competitive and he loved to play the game uh, and so you know this is this is not something that he was putting on in order to make himself feel and look more folksy and to connect with people like his his love for football is very real so i, I just want to wanted to say that it's but... good that you said that because i looked at the the moments um when they would pan over the video cameras would pan over to him in the box and he would be screaming or reacting and it always seemed so contrived to me or or um, like like I could just imagine him not actually knowing anything that was going on, but that's also just because, you know, I'm, I'm oh, no. looking I mean, for that for kind, of, kind of thing. <laughs> no, no, I mean, for real, he is extremely invested, right? And and for him, this, like, this is a huge thing. He, he is a fan before being, like in that moment when you're seeing him react, and really, he he's like on an emotional roller coaster. At one point, you kind of want to tell him, to "Calm down. It's just the game. Like it's gonna be okay." Because you also see him go through all of these different phases. Where at first he's sitting there and he's calm, and you know he's obviously in the uh, in the VIP section, right? He's the president of France. He's not like he's in a more VIP place than Elon Musk or Jared Kushner, who, who mm. were also there in the stadium. Um, and so he's sitting there on this like huge couch kind of seat and at first you know he's wearing his suit he's he's proper and prim and and he's calm and then as the french you know as the argentinian team sort of score their first goal he's like oh my god you can you can see him getting upset but but he he's still like managing to control himself finally the the french equalize he like leaps out of his seat by the way we've seen the same images from the final in russia four years ago where he mm. of course went and 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 attended um and then as things were getting tenser and tenser and like everyone was at the edge of their seat he takes off his his blazer he rolls up his sleeves like what he thinks he's part of the team or he's gonna <laughs> what on, <laughs> a pair of trunks and like run on the pitch no one knows it could be possible with that hole so you you can see him go through that, and then at the end they lose, and like he 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 puts his hat, you know, he he holds his face and his hands, and he's really distraught, like very very distraught. And what was very striking to me in watching that video montage was how completely disconnected he was from his surrounding, meaning all the other dignitaries who were sitting there in the same VIP section were super calm, like. <laughs> 
you know, they were clapping and cheering, but no one was leaping out of their seat. And there is something about Macron where he can be quite oblivious, almost clueless to his surroundings or how things may be perceived. And that goes beyond how he behaves on in a football stadium. Right. Well, I want to I want to touch on something before we move on to the locker room situation. Um, yeah. You used a word that I thought was very interesting. You said he's very invested in um, in football. And I thought that was and I'm, I'm not saying you were insinuating this, but it's an interesting choice of word when you consider uh, that Qatar uh, finances a lot of um, cultural projects uh stadium construction and they also and, own and, and other things France right in paris team. in france That's right so they own up. they <laughs> own the psg team um and so you sort of have this i think like it occurred to me that like of course he's going to be there despite how many like really serious geopolitical reasons he could choose to watch from france instead of being there in person and it's like he's getting wealthy or he he france specifically is being enriched by you know, the Qatari investment in the football team and then having Mbappe on this team for another yeah. three, four years sort of just enriches the country. And like this sort of conflict of interest and being invested, even though there were so many uh, sort of scandalous uh, incidents around around this World Cup, obviously initially the the human rights violations and, and the migrants who were killed during the building of the, the games mm-hmm. and the stu- stadiums, but then also the 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 Barbary or the bribe Barbary the bribery right. scandal um, in the EU uh, Parliament, um, which is that they were being um, certain individuals were basically taking money from the Qataris. So, how do you make sense of his involvement, given that? Right. So, just to clarify what I mean by invested, I mean he is a lifelong fan. Uh, football is very important to him. Uh, you know, this is like really one of one of his big loves in a way, right? I, I wasn't insinuating that he was sort of oh, getting any kind of facts or, or that he had a real conflict of interest when it came to, to money. Now, you do raise another, I think, important part of this, which is he made the decision to go uh, attend both the semifinal and the final uh, games uh, that the French national team uh, basically game played in, in Qatar. He could have, for example, done what the Argentinian president did, which is he declared in a sort of self-deprecating funny way that he didn't want to be the black cat. So he didn't want to curse the national team with his presence. Uh, he wanted them to win. And so he was going to watch the final and the semifinal like everyone else in Argentina from Argentina. That was another model that he could have done. Macron chose from the beginning, as he did, by the way, with the uh, with the World Cup that was um, organized in Russia four years ago, Russia being obviously this country that is run by a man who has very explicit, uh, in, in, you know, in, imperialist, um, uh, expansionist uh, uh, desires and policies towards the entire sort of neighborhood and Europe and obviously doesn't uh, at all uh, respect human rights. He still decided to go to Moscow um, and and attend the games. He was asked about this this year, and Macron said, we shouldn't politicize football. We shouldn't politicize sports. Of course, I honestly think that's a naive thing to say, because of course, politi- of course football is very political. And of course, sports can be political. We've seen actually sports in the history of uh, diplomacy being used in diplomacy. We saw it during the Cold War, for example. There were ping pong games between the two sides, for example, that were used as a way to break the ice on one level or another. So it's very naive. It's also ahistoric to think that, you know, sports are not political. Of course, they can be political. They don't have to be political. And of course, Qatar hosting this World Cup is a very political move. You know, it is uh, the first time an Arab country has hosted uh, the World Cup. There is something about, uh, you know, letting the global South also take part in this huge celebration that is uh, the World Cup every four years. And why should it just be held in, you know, European or North American uh, countries? That's a question that has come up multiple times. South Africa, of course, organized it eight years ago, et cetera, et cetera. So it is political. There's always a political dynamic and and, and like a, a political dimension. And, and like you said, there are 
real allegations, very serious allegations, uh, that say that Qatar got the World Cup uh, organizing rights through corruption. Uh, those are very serious allegations. Um, so all of this is, yes, um, problematic. Uh, Macron just chose to shove it to the side and to go and enjoy uh, the game. Of course, right. like you said, there are also real financial interests between Qatar and France, not just in terms of Qatari direct investment in the French economy, but also given today the need that Europe, in addition to France, and in a way Europe more than France, uh, have for Qatari uh, liquid natural gas, which is uh, one of the most available alternatives to the gas that they can no longer buy from Russia. Right. So that there's, there's that this is a heavy issue. Obviously, I'm only bringing it up because it's like, you know, this was one topic of many that that emerged from Macron's participation in the in the games and the way that he pr chose to participate. Um, and of course, we've seen him many times sort of give a middle finger to uh, certain aspects or certain ideas of decorum in these sorts of uh, scenarios and, and, you know, he does what he's going to do, right? Um, but then, so you, you, you also mentioned earlier about his sort of oblivious state um, as, as being like a recurring theme in, in, in other parts of his presidency as well. And then here we yeah. see him head back into the locker room as well. <laughs> and the best part of these videos, well, best part or most cringeworthy, is seeing the, the you know observing the players who just look like like are you kidding is this what we're forced to to participate in immediately after our defeat which is sort of like can we not have a moment to ourselves um, i think there's bewilderment that? on their faces they're bewildered they're sitting there being like what is going on like what is happening um yeah that was that was such a strange thing to do so I totally understand why he went on the pitch and like tried to console some of the players immediately after the Croatian president did the same, by the way, um, eight years ago, if I'm not mistaken, when Croatia was uh, lost to France, she did the same, but then she didn't go to the locker room, or at least if she did, she didn't have her personal videographer shoot it, record it, and then immediately post it on social media, like immediately, quasi instantaneously. And oh. I think this is the bigger problem here so he gets on the pitch he consoles everyone um and he goes and sees them in the locker room and he gives this what he thinks is a rousing speech for three minutes something like out of the hollywood movie you know where the team is losing it's halftime and the coach goes in and gives them this very inspiring uh speech and then they go out and they win the game except here the game is over they've lost and most crucially Macron isn't the coach. He's the president of the country, like the political president. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of people were like, this is not his job. And, and actually the coach of the national team was standing right next to him. You know, of course, they all have to be very deferential and very respectful. They can't exactly tell the president to please shut up and stop talking and leave us alone. So everyone sat there, um, not really engaged, not really feeling inspired. And kind of just waiting for the moment to be over, to be honest. And he, you could feel within his way, I mean, maybe I'm very sensitive to this because I've obviously spent way too much time listening to him and watching him and, and being in his vicinity. But you you could see, you could hear in his voice, his voice was 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 cracking. It was, it wasn't his usual um, timber. It wasn't his usual tone. He really was very uh, sort of, you know, emotional about this this whole situation. And I felt like he gave this speech also in part for himself, like to console himself as a fan. <laughs> um, bizarrely, I, I don't know if I can say that. And I have to say in that moment, I was talking about it to my sister and, and she said something that was so funny. She said, you know what he reminds me of? He reminds me of Michael Scott from yep. The Office. Like, yep. And I just thought that was such a brilliant... Uh, a brilliant comparison because yeah, like in the, the sense that the guy you know, that can't read the room, he can't read the room, but he means well. It's not like he's trying to be this annoying person who is annoying everyone and 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 sort of you know attention grabbing. He's just so clueless that he doesn't realize that he's being that way. And I think there was a part of that 
uh, with Macron, especially in that locker room scene. And especially since, so the, the, the Elysee videographer was there, recorded the whole thing, and then immediately posted it online. And I think his comms team thought that that would be something that would be seen as, uh, you know, being inspirational and this president who doesn't give up even in the times of defeat. <sighs> and I think they just yeah. misread the whole room of the entire country. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't that, isn't that a, a repeat of uh, <laughs> other, other moments we've had where it seems like a running theme. Is too, yeah, a running yeah. theme and like his team is not really getting the right, they're not nailing it. They're, they're sort of just always offbeat. Um, the other thing I was going to say is that it feels very American to me, actually, you know, how American, the, the American political system, which was, highly satirized on uh, on veep which i'm sure you've seen yeah. um and you know this idea that there's always a camera following there's always a photo op let's do this the optics will be good and it seems like macron is a president unlike perhaps others in or at least in past memory especially compared to Hollande, who really leverages that idea um do you think he's sort of i don't know taking on a uh, a media uh, strategy that more resembles what an American president might do? Um, well, that's a good question. I think that he is, his comms team think that they are master storytellers. The issue is that they are really in the minority in thinking that. Um, I think a lot of, <laughs> I think a lot of their comms choices have been flops and actually have opened him up to so much more criticism than he should have been opened up to. I think part of being a comms advisor or in the comms team of a presidency, and, and you know, bear in mind a presidency that is as important and as powerful as, as the French one. Um, I always say this to, to American uh, sort of listeners and readers, uh, the French president actually in, in effect, concretely has more executive power uh, that is unchecked than the U.S. president, because the U.S. president has to deal with an extremely empowered Congress and an extremely empowered Supreme Court. Those don't exist in France in that way. They do not have the same political means and leverage and power. And so the French president really is a modern day Republican monarch in many ways, in the sense that he is in a republic, but he really does have monarchical powers in some ways when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to defense policy, when it comes to internal interior security policy. Um, and I think that's an important difference. Um, and so when you're the comms team of someone that is that important, your job is also to make sure that you shield him from criticism, that you help him get the best press and coverage possible. And they don't seem to perceive things the way most of us perceive it. They seem to think that truly everything he touches turns to gold. And so it makes them a little bit, it gives them a big blind spot in how they present him. I think sometimes they've agreed or they've themselves shot scenes with him and then published them on YouTube or on his various social media platforms and accounts that they thought were going to make him look presidential and like a world leader and in truth make him look while well, not so presidential and not like the leader they think he is. And, and that I think is unfortunate because at, at all of this aside, I think France plays an important role on the global stage. I think the world needs a France that is serious and has the means of its ambitions. And, you know, multilateralism needs that. And I think that Macron is someone who had the potential to be, uh, you know, to play a really important role on the global stage. And, and unfortunately, so far, he hasn't lived up to that potential. Right. Uh, it's, a, it's a mix of his own decisions and also some of the, the comms uh, around him. And I, I love that you bring up Veep because, first of all, it's one of my <laughs> favorite shows. Julia Louis-Dreyfus is a genius queen, of comedy. Queen, yes, absolute queen. queen. Her, her, you know, her, her, her timing, her everything about her is amazing. And yeah. I think that speech in the locker room is something that Julia Louis-Dreyfus's 
uh, or what's it called, character in Veep would have done. And she would have walked away thinking, look at me, I did something great. And I, I think Macron really thought he he was so right to do that speech and he doesn't realize that it was a little bit out of place. Right. Yeah. And it's funny because I got a lot of heat. Well, a lot. I mean, it's all relative, but I had a few, <laughs> I had a good, a good, good smattering of responses, mostly from French people who follow me, who thought I was being too severe. I was being too yeah. unfair in my interpretation that he, it was cringy and that he should never have been doing it in the first place. And, you know, I say that there were a, those people tend to be older, right? The the people who thought, give him a break. If he didn't go in there, if he didn't try to console them, you know, the population would have criticized him for it. The younger generation, like, so I don't know, between teens and, you know, early 30s were the people who were sending around the memes and and clearly like, oh God, this guy is just too much. Um, and the Americans, I think, also looked at it like, Oh, come on, man. Like, give it a rest. Um, and that's being like really yeah. diplomatic in my way of saying it. But I just found he, it interesting he, to hear he often from people. That kind of reaction from the Americans, just like when he went to the States and on December 1st and, and the baguette was, you know, entered into the, 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 the world's, um, uh, UNESCO, intangible yeah. UNESCO, uh, you know, heritage. And, and he stood there and he, he was, brandishing a baguette like it was a sword and it was like oh right. i mean come on the memes <laughs> it just, just write themselves you know um it's I, true. I think actually the generational divide that you underline and bring up is extremely on point and true um yes the older generation first of all tend to be a little bit less harsh with him uh, they tend to give him more of a pass, even on matters of policy, you know, much more important than this World Cup and, and how he was reacting uh, to a football game at the end of the day. Um, they are his core uh, voters, the especially retirees um, are the people who voted the most for him. Mm -hmm. uh, they tend to give him a pass because they also tend to have a sense of we shouldn't humiliate him and we shouldn't be uh, so harsh in our public criticism of him because the reputation and standing of France also depends on him. And they want to preserve the standing and reputation of France on the world stage. It's very important for them. The younger generation cares less about that, lives in a world that is much more globalized. Their actual real world is in a way social media right. and to them they see other you know citizens from other countries taking pot shots at their own leaders and they don't see that as a way of attacking their own uh patriotism or diminish diminishing their own country and i think that's it's going to be interesting to see whether this generation that is now mm. comfortable with that will continue being comfortable with it as they grow older i'm not sure about that we'll see Man, I mean, the, the, the conversations we could have about, you know, the generational divide and how he is or isn't living up to his potential. I mean, we could literally have an entire show. Um, <laughs> but I'm so glad I was able to at least get you on finally for something that is like so fresh and that we're probably going to be talking about for a little while, at least until the next faux pas. Um, I, if, I, if, if, I, if we were to leave people with anything, what would you say um, is sort of like what what are your visions for the next year in his term right because we've he's barely done a first term in his second um sorry a first year in his second term um people are a bit you know like is he asleep at the wheel what is happening um what do you yeah, hope there... for in the next year so there's definitely a sense that he's been uh desperately sort of looking for a way through his second term. We still don't really understand what he wants to really do with his second term and what his vision is for his second term, which is problematic for someone who's always presented himself as a as an ideas man and a visionary. Um, so that I think I wonder if he's going to take uh, the next few days because he he does take a break over Christmas uh, and retreats. I wonder if he's going to take a break to first of all 
get some rest because he's very, very tired and, and no one can actually blame him for being tired. You know, he, he had to manage two years of COVID, went straight into his presidential re-election campaign. And then, of course, as the Ukraine war was happening, the biggest, most consequential war on European soil since the Second World War. So it's like, it's not light stuff, right? So I think he's tired and I think he needs to reset and take a break. So I hope he's going to take the next few, like the next 10 days to do that and try to to be fresher uh, in the new year. Um, he has big, big issues on his plate. You know, he wants to do the pension reform in France. That is going to be uh, really a, a just sort of a bare knuckle uh, battle um, in, in, in France. I'm expecting quite a bit of... Um, uh, protests because not just because, you know, the stereotype of the French love to protest and to strike, but because, I mean, this really is a very fundamental issue for, for the French and how they perceive their own social security and, and societal model. So I think that's a big one. Uh, obviously the Ukraine war is going to continue being a huge one with its ramifications when it comes to cost of living and, and also energy, uh, um, uh, uh, supply uh, for next winter because we're okay for this winter, but the energy supplies for next winter are the big are the big big question. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't look like Macron is about to uh, be any clearer in his positioning when it comes to the role that he wants France to play uh, in um, confronting Russia, in rolling it back. Uh, from Ukraine to Russia. He keeps seesawing between asserting his uh, complete and utter support for Ukrainian victory, but also constantly saying we need to give security, uh, security guarantees to Russia, you know, the aggressor that keeps invading its neighbors. Right. Um, and we need to build a security architecture, so like a new security order with Russia, as opposed to saying we need to build a security order from Russia. Like we need to secure Europeans, uh, EU countries and NATO countries from Russian aggression. And he doesn't seem to be uh, on a path to change that and and give more clarity and more reliability and more confidence uh, for his partners and his allies in the East, the Baltic states and the Eastern European states, uh, in France's ability to lead. Because he keeps saying, you know, the Europeans have to do more for their own security and rely less on the US, which, by the way, is welcomed in Washington, D.C., because they want to be able to shift a lot of those resources that they're sinking into Europe yet again since World War II uh, towards China. But clearly we saw that when this war started, well, it was up to, it really came down to American leadership to save Europe again. Mm. Um, and this is where Macron has failed to live up to his own stated, explicitly stated ambition and his own potential. And I think it's going to be very hard for him to turn it around. Um, but let's see, who knows? He, he, he really has always been able to uh, retain an ability to surprise us. So maybe 2023 will have more surprises. Let's see. Well, we go from joking about the locker room situation to some very serious uh, issues of inertia. So let's hope you're right and that he does sort of sort it out in 2023. But as always, it's it's so fantastic to have your commentary. Usually I just get it uh, one on one. But in now a cafe I get to, in right in a cafe <laughs> or over text. But now I get to share it with with a broader audience. So Reem, thanks for taking um, some time out of your afternoon. And uh, let's hope we have more to discuss. Surely we will. Uh, in the coming year. Thank you for having me and happy holidays to everyone. Yeah, bonne fête. That's the show for today. As always, thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing with friends. You can find all previous episodes of the New Paris podcast wherever you stream your podcasts and on World Radio Paris. If you're enjoying these conversations, please consider picking up a copy of the New Paris book or my recent release, The New Parisienne, from your local booksellers. Until next time, I'm